I grow, I grow facial hair like it doesn't take long at all. Yeah. I'm not. It, it's I. Matt, take it away. So, anyway. all right, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here today for another Cornwell team training. We have Matt Shaver from Foundation Restoration, and I met Matt probably about 10 years ago when I was a steward title, and I was uh, signing, we were out of closing, he was signing documents, <laughs> and I notarized his documents and all that kind of thing. And then I bought my first flip property uh, on uh, Illinois Street, 510 West Illinois, and uh, somewhere around 2010, 2011, we ha I found out all about what a uh, beetle is, a, what do they call them? Anoid. Anoid beetle, but there's another. Uh, yeah, blood destroying organism yeah. is what you see on, on your inspection. Anyway, I had beetle damage in the in the foundation, in the cross members, and all the wood members of the foundation area. And I learned all about what causes that and uh, how to s solve that problem. He'll probably touch on that today. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much well, for being yeah, here today. For sure, thanks for having me. Hey guys, again, Matt Shaver, Foundation Restoration. Uh, located here in Bellingham, Washington. Technically been in business since 2008. Uh, there's been a couple of versions of our company in the back office in terms of uh, buying out uh, a couple of partners as they retire. We moved on. I'm the founder and the owner of the company, and uh, really been um, a wonderful experience. You guys have uh, we have done quite a bit of work with Tim. And the Bellwether real estate team, uh, period, across the board, uh, were really active in the residential and commercial and civil and industrial market in Bellingham and the greater kind of Northwest. We've traveled as far south as San Diego for our commercial work and as far east as Denver. So um, it's been a fun thing. We concentrate on concrete restoration, waterproofing, and high performance coatings, anti-slip, antimicrobial stuff. We won't talk about any of that today, but we do that in the commercial world. If you guys dip, dibble, dabble, whatever, dibble, dabble in those kind of realms, we often um, hang out with property management companies to solve those problems as the tenants with them. So we won't even talk about any of that. We'll touch on some um, balcony deck and deck waterproof membranes that you guys might come across on your properties. But what I wanted to do today is just kind of go through some basic building um, construction practices, uh, methods, and means that you guys see when you're out there. It's uh, There's a myriad of different ways that people have built, particularly in this city over the last 120 years, and we've seen them all. So we're going to touch on some of this stuff. I want to start with just some basic foundation details. I've uh, drawn some here. These are the things that you see Sarah actually just showed a, a, a photo there from an inspection report. When you get those inspection reports, all those red lines pointing at concrete with cracks in it, settling, uh, that was a gray beam she showed me that's got cracks in it. Um, those are the things that we repair and we're gonna talk about some of that. But I think the first thing we need to do is just kind of understand the nomenclature about how things are built so that you guys have a really good idea when you rock and roll into a place, even for the first time. A lot of real estate agents go in you know, way ahead and they start seeing, well, we got some things we definitely need to do with it. We got water in the basement. We got cracks in the concrete. We've got weird displacement. You got, we walk on the driveway, slab jack, that kind of stuff. So I want to talk about a few of those things and then we'll talk about how to fix them. So first of all, it's better if I stay on this Yeah, it's great. Just get, so uh, typical foundation construction. So before the 40s and it's, directly tied to the, the war, World War II. Uh, we didn't produce a whole lot of steel that went into residential construction. And in fact, most of the places that we see around here that we work on for our crawl space rehab work is post and block or post and board beam. You hear both and. And we're, we're gonna get into a little bit of that. But first, let's talk about concrete construction. So when you walk into a basement, in a 1920s to 1940s home, you're gonna see interesting looking concrete that they formed with the floor boards. So they're kind of the first reuse, recycle, re whatever, right? It was what they used. To, it was a great way to do it. They had, they milled the lumber on the site, they 
built their walls to pour their concrete in, and then they would pour concrete around the whole thing. We often get cold joints and cracks because of the way they used to do it. So what happens is, and uh, the typical is, you'd see a concrete stem wall. This is looking at it in cross sections, so right down the middle. But they didn't put a footing underneath it. A lot of times they did this during uh, the first phase of construction, if it was a basement, and then they built on top of it. Oftentimes when the homeowner got a little bit of more money, they would go and they would pour it around like skirting to keep rodents out. So we often find that under these guys, we have no footing. This is another version of what they did. And while it might look like a footing, I kind of drew it weird on purpose because this is just slough that came out. They overdug and then they poured their, put their formwork in and it blew out at the bottom. And it disguises itself as a footing, but it has no structural, little to no structural value whatsoever. The other thing about these homes and a lot of our bigger commercial buildings downtown, there's no rebar in it. So we're often, if we're trying to do something like go up with a second story, we have to go through structural engineering to do rebar replacement, add new footings, drive steel into the ground, et cetera, to go up. So they didn't use rebar a lot uh, because it was expensive and they really didn't have it down as to how they were going to manufacture this stuff and get it into the marketplace. So it's a big geeky session we can get into about the history of concrete and steel construction, but we won't do that today. <laughs> so you're going to find a lot of this. So stem wall and then footing. But this is kind. Of, this is the way it really ought to look like. Newer construction up to current code. You're going to have a big footing underneath it. They typically pour that first. Depending upon the size of the building that's being placed on it is going to determine the size of your footing. Once that's two stories is eight inch stem wall. Um, six to eight inch stem wall. This guy right here then gets poured on top of the footing. And then what we have, and we're going to get back to this, is called cold joint. It is an open capillary between the footing and the stem wall. So when you see water intrusion in this construction method or in this construction method, what has happened is they have poured the basement slab like so up against it, and capillary action takes place. Groundwater's high around here, um, and so what occurs are two things. We have two different phenomena. So we have cracks in the concrete, water migrates through it easily. It's a very small molecule, it finds a path of least resistance, it gets in there. If there's a finished basement, it's ruined. When there's water, it's ruined. Your soft goods, your drywall, your carpet, mold of mildew, to take place, etc. When you so you have vertical, sorry, horizontal plane, and then you have hydrostatic pressure. And hydrostatic pressure is when water molecule or vapor molecule finds the path of least resistance and wicks its way up through cold joints. Anywhere where two pieces of concrete come together and meet, it's called a cold joint. That is a open highway for water to transmit and get into your conditioned space. It comes and it follows any path. It really doesn't matter. They don't care. Those molecules don't care. They will get in every time. It happens in new construction too. Now we have methodologies in place that we put water stops here on new construction. And when we are performing work on new buildings, we have a, a bentonite clay system that we put down right here to waterproof with a drain mat on top of it that directs all the water to the tight lines and the perforate, well, sorry, to the perforated drain lines around your footing. That gets the water away from your space. This is something that the best builders, the best residential builders in town always do. If you're below grade and you've got conditioned living space, daylight basement, or just a basement, this is best practice, particularly if it's finished. There's so many. It's hard sometimes to be in this business and walk into a, a house that's two or three years old and tell the new homeowner that they have a pretty significant issue and that they need to tear their basement, and which could be if it's daylight, you've got a couple of bedrooms, a bath, a living room, great room, and they're removing it all. And unfortunately, insurance doesn't cover that. That is not an insurable kind of claim. It just it doesn't happen. 
uh, never, not once. Uh, only if there's sewer involved will it. So it's pretty heartbreaking to look at a client and say, I'm so sorry, you just bought this thing, but this is gonna be about forty, fifty thousand dollars to fix. It's pretty tough. Not because it's just my work, because all the finished with it that has to go back into it. It's really rough. Best practice is always that. So if you guys are working with new builders building, digging out big basements and they're developing stuff and they're doing that and you're listing it, it's a really good thing to see. If you don't have it, what ends up happening is water at some point will move through the concrete, go through this little cold joint, and again, move right here through the slab. This is a slab. And affect the living space. So we deploy different things to mitigate that uh, all the time. We're going to get to the means, of, to the, the processes, and the things that we do uh, momentarily. I kind of wanted to give you guys some an outline of just what you should see when you see new construction. Um, I mean, when you see concrete construction in a basement, you're going to look for cracks. You're going to that's going to alarm you to something. Is there water here? And then you got that form 17, I think it is, right? It's really important um, to make sure if there has been if there has been active leak that people are recognizing that. And a lot of times that's when we get called in to come and fix it, and oftentimes get paid out of closing, out of escrow because we have. So, uh, and for you guys, uh, that's something that I want to offer you. I don't with everybody, but with um, with you guys with Tim, um, I would love to just extend the offer to your client base. That in the event you run into any of the circumstances that I'm going to describe today, I'm happy to be paid at closing. Okay, so I will offer you the the I'll get the estimate. I'm going to share with you some of the way our estimates look, so you understand their narrative. They have a scope of work. They talk about what's going on with the property. And they talk about how we're going to fix it, and it's really clear and clean. So our goal is to be very transparent to the owner. The owner doesn't necessarily know what construction looks like. They sure knows, know what clean looks like. They know what water is. Yeah. So we really want to be upfront with all that good stuff. So I want to offer that to you. We'll talk about those specifics later. Um, one of the things. Can you give out the handout? Um, oh yeah, thanks. Totally forgot though. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna show you the handout. And you know what, I have two copies here that I'd like to give you guys to just kind of look through, pass those around. Those are estimates that we present to our clients. And it kind of gives you an idea of how to spell things out. So this is kind of, this is foundation construction with concrete. But we don't just have that happen in, in Bellingham, Washington, the Northwest, anywhere with older homes. So, um, Structural framing, cross space, Sarah, that, that image that you showed me when I walked in, that's in a cross space. That is um, not unique at all. It has a post, has, it has, I'm sorry, it has a block with the foundation, the pier blocks. Sometimes they're made of concrete. What you're going to see a lot of times on the inspection report if you guys don't crawl underneath the house, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Um, because it is morose, and we're going to talk about some of that in a few minutes. It's kind of funny. Um, it's all wood framing with a skirting around it. And so most of the time what we see in crawl spaces is a block, a post, and they're going to be on X centers, so meaning X amount of feet apart, <coughs> distributed kind of equally through the cross space, <laughs> but not so much. <laughs> it's, that's when you see the sagging. That's when you see that the span between the beam is way too long between posts. Mm -hmm. We really, our rule of thumb is eight, six to eight feet. We're gonna talk about when to get a structural engineer involved and when not to. Most people say yes. Um, so maybe that's why I shouldn't have this recorded too. Just kidding, my engineer buddies out there. Don't Just give a it. disclaimer. <laughs> Just give a quick disclaimer. Yeah, for sure. Structural engineering is a great thing to do. And we recommend it often in very difficult situations. But we have a prescribed method that we use to correct these things. And we actually get these permitted with the city of Bellingham. We have to. Uh, we recently, we didn't because we thought we were under the 
We were doing this like for like replacement. We're replacing an old six by six rotten post with a brand new treated six by six. My buddies at the city told me, Shaver, you gotta get that permitted. I was like, but you've always said like for like. Yeah, but no, you gotta get it permitted. And so we have moved down the road of dotting our eyes, crossing our T's and making sure that when we're done, you have a permitted piece. Uh, it's kind of a new development for us, uh, but it's a really wise and smart thing to do. So um, what happens between posts is they then place these beams. And they're a variety of things. They can be crazy, both the posts and the beams. We recently did a job on North that had old charred wood, the entire structure below grade was all fire treated, meaning they burnt it on purpose to make sure bugs wouldn't get into it. It's actually kind of interesting. <laughs> and then they use the trees from the lot for the post and the beams. How do we say to the city, like for like, that's when they're like, yeah, just bring it up to code. And so um, it would, every single piece of wood that we pulled out of that thing was 140 year old fir and cedar wow. and um and very very we we replaced every single solitary member underneath that job so underneath that house so what happens a lot of times is this span between the post is way too great to carry the load of the house because what they do on here is they hang their joist this is going to represent a joist so that runs the opposite direction so this is often what we, we find this every, everywhere we go. Um, one of the things that you guys always see in here is shims. You see those things? You've got one in that, in that image. They can be a, a, a variety of different materials and media. I mean, we have seen dirt. We have seen like they pack like drought. We have seen a variety of different types of wood. But they're always doing like this, and they're always trying to get it back, and, they're, and it's moving, and something's happening, and the force is just taking it a different way than it ought to go. So those things need to come out and be replaced with solid members. So what we end up doing is actually bringing that to code by putting positive connections from posts, sorry, from, from block to base, they connect together, and then from post to beam, that kind of straps in kind of something like this I'm not the greatest artist on the planet and that connects everything together giving it a positive connection that the city likes to see that also moves all the action down into the post base so your image on that has a bunch of that um, that's been done fine but starting to move we're gonna definitely get into that thing um, Beam locations and blocks and rim joists and joists. So when you're looking at a, when you're looking, if you're standing inside a basement, let's imagine just inside a basement, we look up. And what we see is our four joists, the members that are running. And that is carrying your floor, your sub floor, that then your finish floor is on top of. The joists are then placed on this beam, on top of this beam, that are placed on top of these posts that are placed on top of these bases. When anything moves throughout, it gives up the ghost down here. So that's what we see a lot of. So we always have to correct from the bottom up. Um, is it everybody familiar with joists? Everybody familiar with rim joists? Rim joists is the one that runs around the exterior. Mm -hmm. That the joists then connect to. And then you side down over top of or sheet over top of it and side over top of. Um, in post and block homes, they don't often have them because they are skirted around the exterior or exterior with chicken wire and old, old sand mix. It's called parge coat. It's kind of like the old school stucco method where they would, oh, we, got it, we can't afford or we don't want to do concrete. We don't want to lift it up and re-pour could have been the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, up to the 80s, 90s to now. And then they would put a piece of backing. Oftentimes we see tongue and groove vertically into the dirt. 
which gets popped on inspection, inspection every time. Chicken wire, sand mix, troweled, and it looks like it's concrete. Oh, wow. It's not concrete, and it's not a footing. It's not a stem wall. It's skirting. It's just a road barrier and an air barrier. See it often. We're removing one today. And, uh, yeah, it's a big one. And so, not the easiest, not the hardest thing to remove, but then we got to go back with skirting, which is marine grade plywood or hardy board. That's what the city likes to see and what we've always practiced anyway because it's weather resistant and it's rated for ground contact. So, the skirting then hangs around this guy and it's just kind of there. It can be anything. We've seen brick, we've seen glass, we've seen funky, funky stuff. Um, some of the things that we find in crawl spaces, I wanted to ask you guys, what do you think? And when we walk in a crawl space with our monkey suits on and our half mask respirators, uh, we require two people in a crawl space at all, all times and one on the outside doing the other work. Um, what, what, are the, what do you think the top three, what is one thing you guys think we find inside a crawl space? Rodents and animals. Hanging insulation. Oh, that for sure. Poop. That for sure. Poop. Dead bodies. All of you would be all of all of those answers are correct. Water. Dead Water. Bodies. All <laughs> those things are correct. The number one thing that's not technically a part of the building that we find is carcasses. Carcasses. Um, yeah, we have found a cat and a possum spooning. Oh my gosh. In skeleton form. We have found a family of possums in skeleton form. We have found a lot of weird stuff. A lot of old booze bottles. A lot of old booze bottles. A lot of coins from all over the place. As we dig, we find this stuff. Uh, it's just kind of, it's really random. But the number one thing we find in crawl spaces is rot. Mm -hmm. And WDO. <coughs> WDOs of destroying organisms. That's what you have. Yeah. And yours was prolific. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and Alexis is still there and she loves yeah. it. And um, it is, uh, it's constant. It's daily. Jason Smalls, a residential uh, services manager, he's out there looking at these every single day. And so that's when we come in and we remove the, remove the post, remove the beam, and set new treated. Um, rot is, um, can show its face in several ways. It's easy when you see it because it looks decayed and it could be gone, it could be dry, and it's good. If we can punch a quarter of an inch to a half an inch into a post, it's pretty much shot. Um, can't really fasten a whole lot to it. We really want to be careful with that. And we always, always exceed what we think we should do. We overbuild on purpose. Um, we are not, I, I want to be really clear with this, uh, we are, we've often been going, ah, oh, shop, Matt Shaver, foundation restoration is too expensive. I'd rather call it not cheap. Um, <laughs> we, we, we don't want to be the most, we don't want to be that. We want to be right, and that's what makes it worth it to us. Um, my guys do make more money by going in crawl spaces. Uh, they have a lot of quiet time and interpersonal healing that can happen in there. <laughs> um, it is a uh, very, it can be really rough, and there's times that we're in there. And I mean, I've got a couple guys that exceed 6'2", and you know, it can be something. We do not, by the way, and nor can we physically work under any crawl space that's under 18 inches. So if you give us a call and we want to go out there, we go out there and we find that it's under 18, 18 inches or under, we're going to, we're sorry, you got to call these guys to dig this thing out because we just can't. We just don't have the manpower to get in there. And I really like my guys and we have a lot of, I've kept them all. We've got great retention. So the same guys that have been on your job site four years ago will be on your job site tomorrow, which is really important to me. That's a big part of our culture that I want to keep intact. So can't dig those guys out anymore. Um, so that's kind of a quick little rundown of how these things are built. And we can ask do, do some Q&A on this later. Um, vapor barrier in crawl spaces, that's a big one. Vapor barrier traditionally is four mil black plastic polyethylene sheet, call it visqueen. Um, it's crap. <laughs> 
I mean, it's just, it's not, it's not worth anything. If you're trying to protect against vapor, that's not doing it. Uh, we do not do that. We come in with 10 to 15 mil vapor barrier. We go up the sides of the walls, stem walls, skirting, whatever, to terminate all the way around. We actually then move up and we boot up every post and we tape around it. Um, we tape all of our joints and all of our seams. Why do we do it? Because it's the right thing to do. It's a vapor barrier. If it's overlapped and flapping in the wind, that's where the vapor's going. If the vapor's going that way, what's water doing? Going that way. Absolutely. And so why we cannot control the earth and how the water moves in and out of it and on top of it, we can mitigate. And so when you have a crawl space sitting on, down, on top of the earth, the earth's going to do what it's going to do. So we're going to put vapor barrier under it to make on the ground to make sure that the water stays underneath it. There are times we have to install some pump pits in those as well. Okay, so kind of some basics on that kind of stuff. I'm going to talk to you real quick about how we fix those things for the foundations now. So this is kind of this is where I get uber geeky, but I will not in order to maintain clarity and stay away from fatigue. <laughs> um, so our company builders are, so I'll use this. So um, with the foundation, uh, with concrete, so we do below grade negative side waterproofing. You have a list of our uh, line card there. We do structural crack repair and injection, injection, basement waterproofing. And we'll talk about crawl space rehab. We also are licensed and bonded with everything on earth with a ton of insurance and we do seismic retrofits. So, uh, cross uh, foundation concrete. How do we fix this water? We have two, we have several methods. One is called below grade negative side waterproofing, and that's the use of a product called Cypax. It is a crystalline hydrophilic grout that when it comes, in, when water comes in contact with it, it grows crystals into the substrate, stopping that path of least resistance, halting that water flow. So if water is migrating, up into our capillary in any form or fashion. We come in and we break out the cold joint with our roto hammers, like so. And then we pack uh, dry pack material, the Zypex pack and uh, plug, uh, plug, Zypex plug, patch and plug. And then we slurry coat over top of it. And we typically go all the way out about 10 to 12 inches up the wall and onto the slab. And we do that around the perimeter. We can also do spot treatment, but with the caveat of, hey, we will warranty that which we repaired. Water goes somewhere else, we we'll have to come back, additional charge. If you see water and it's a small basement, it's always worth doing the whole thing. So, so when water comes in contact with our Zypex, the Zypex begins to fire crystal growth. There's test data that indicate the Zypex can grow in a column form 32 feet. Well, we really don't need that. <laughs> so um, we do this in water waste water treatment. We've done it on dams. We've done it in refineries to keep water out. Uh, we any there's most every lift station here in Bellingham we per perform that work in as well as manholes. So and in a ton of homes. So in that situation, this is called a rat slab, by the way. You guys ever heard that term, rat slab? So back in the day when they did the basement, they didn't have money to do the, do the floor. They just didn't even think about it. They finally did it. And all they did is pump concrete down there, finish it. They didn't care what thickness or grade. So we get in there and we find anything from a one inch of coverage over the soil to six inches to even more. We don't know. Can't tell. Um, this material works in conjunction with the Portland cement and all the other materials that are inside concrete. It uses, it chemically reacts and that's when it grows the crystals. This stuff is really, um, has been unbelievably effective for us over the years. However, it doesn't work with the dirt. So in the event that we know we have a cross, a, a rat slab or a slab that is too thin, 
to encourage the growth of crystals, therefore waterproof your property, your basement below grade. We actually go in and we cut internal trench drains. So if we didn't have enough coverage, we would saw cut out, we would install a tight line, I'm sorry, a perforated line, put pea gravel in, and we would slope it to the lowest part of the basement floor, install a sump pit and pump, and then pump it into sewer. What? Yeah, that's why I brought this. Sewer? Yes, sir, because nobody ever thinks I'm right. And so we finally got the city to send me a email. Feel free to read that. They want to maintain the water supply, so they determine that anything within the confines or the perimeter of the home or building can be discharged from a sump pit and into the sanitary sewer, as opposed to, so I have been called on the carpet by real estate agents, I've been called on the carpet by plumbers, and I've been on, called on the carpet by contractors, and I've been called on the carpet by the city of Bellingham, and I have produced that, and they look up the RCW, and they're like, oh, yeah, okay, you are right. <laughs> And so um, you can always get that from, from me. So any water that accumulates in a crawl space. Or in a basement. Or in a basement. The disposal of that water shall, in the city of Bellingham anyway, yes. shall go to the sanitary sewers. Yes. Now Ferndale, Linden, Can't Blaine might be that. different. Haven't, gotcha. haven't had that much of a conflict. But at least in the city of Bellingham. Any water in a crawl space or a basement must be disposed of, if you are to dispose of it, in the sanitary Counterintuitive to everything we've ever been told, right? Told, right? Yeah, because you're thinking storm water. Yeah, there you well, go. Thinking so you get the storm. plumbing aspects of this as well. Yeah, right? so we plumb right in. We can. So typically install a Y. Boom. So uh, check valves are all right. in there. Same. It's got all of it. Um, and we have backup systems we can play as we can get into the crazy nuances of all these systems if we want to. But in terms of like your basic kind of waterproofing procedures, um, when you come, when we see this stuff, we're going to give you an estimate. And there's one floating around with side packs for doing this. And then if we can't do that, we do that. Honestly, there uh, this one's a little bit more expensive because of the labor. We've got to pull in a concrete pump and a ready mix truck. Sometimes we do hand mix it. Um, but that is that's the way we solve those below. So the perf problems. pipe that perf pipe diagram mm -hmm. The perf pipe is at the base of the stem wall Inside the basement. Yeah, so let's draw. Okay, again. so the exterior is the left the interior is on the right Yeah, this is exterior. This okay. is outside. This is inside. Okay, and so if we were to draw it here It would look like this and here's our slab, right? We get rid of this guy, we cut right here, we excavate down like so. We want to get underneath the stem wall, this is where the earth is. We get underneath the stem wall, we place a perforated pipe right there. Plastic? We plastic PVC, three to four inch, depending upon what we're up to and how big and how deep and how much water, etc. Um, perfs are facing down. Something nobody does either. Uh, we dig them out all the time with the perfs up. The perforations actually mean that crap's getting in there. So we then sleeve this with geotextile fabric. We backfill with pea gravel or drain rock, depending upon the size of our excavation, leaving ourselves some room. We then pour concrete back. And this is, and all the water is directed. We did a job on G Street about three years ago. We got it all sloped and all drained. We were in the middle of a big rainstorm. We did the entire perimeter. We also do spider webs, we call it, across. So when we know we need to collect more water, we will cut up slabs and we will do that. Sometimes we remove whole slabs and we pull back. Um, and we got it all to slope. There wasn't a single pipe in the ground yet, but he had an existing sump pit and pump and pit. And the water just it created it was flood, it was pouring so fast and running so fast through our newly created ditch that it created a siphon inside a sump pit and that pump couldn't keep up. So we had to grab another one and throw it in there just to get it. It's amazing. That's on G Street near Walker Middle School. 
So we have a lot of this in this town. All right, I'll give you a little. I'll give you a little inside info. Here's good intel. Number one. Number one. Uh, I'd say. I'd say number one. Maybe there's two of them. Real close, neck and neck. Broadway Park. We've. I bet you we've done eighty percent of the homes there. Seventy for sure. Whoa. Um, and around I'm talking all Lyle Street. It's from West Illinois down that ravine where they used to where they back basically backfilled uh, the the old creek. Um, we have a lot of that there. Columbia does not have as much. We have more kind of rot and seismic over there than anything. Um, South Hill, we could be called South Hill Foundation Restoration Waterproofing.com and open up a shop right down at the base if we wanted to. There's no reason we're in Birmingham, but I'm saying that is the majority of our waterproofing, seismic retrofit, structural stabilization, and pin pile driving is done on South Hill. So, just something to think about. <laughs> Um, it's a, they're still great homes and they can be restored, but that's a really key thing. So when it comes to foundation um, waterproofing, that's the way we do it. We are able to do this work on the inside as long as it's not finished, and sometimes even if it is, cheaper than excavating from the outside, waterproofing the concrete, mm -hmm. installing tight lines and from your downspouts, installing perforated trench drains or footing drains all the way around. We can do this work way cheaper than that work. Then it's landscape and then it's everything else, tearing up your yard, all that good stuff. So this is a really great option that is cost effective for your client. Um, we often go behind guys that have done this work and it's not any of their fault. Um, the reality is they just don't know um, the situations where you have a stem wall that terminates into the ground with no footing, like this detail, like I've drawn here, what's happening? If you excavate down and you do this detail on this side, cool, but you're not taking care of any of the hydrostatic pressure or groundwater moving up. So that's where the capillary, that's the, that is the smoking done, is that guy in any cracks. So we can do this. We can do this procedure on cracked concrete that's got water present, um, vertical cracks, on both slab and in the stem wall, uh, and then the cold joint all the way around. Um, let's see, um, we can keep on rocking. So when it comes to our crawl space rehab work, we, call, we are called on this a lot. We've, kind of, we've touched on it, we've talked about the weird stuff that we see in it, uh, the rot. Um, we always replace rot and wood destroying organisms. So that's done. I've mentioned a little bit of, uh, about that. We can go in and we can spot treat. I don't want you guys to think that everything has to be done just wholesale, just boom, stem to stern, it's all gone. We basically have lifted the house, might as well pour it a new one. Um, it doesn't pencil out quite like that, but um, when we get into those situations, we do move in with everything new. Um, it is a laborious job uh, that we definitely will, we do a lot of, I just want you to know, I said it earlier, sometimes we're called a little, maybe we're too expensive. Everything we do at the end of the day is worth it. It's still cheaper than picking up and then pouring a new one. And we've bid a ton of those and we've done a lot of them for the client that wants it. So there are, there's always options, but we've kind of talked about enough of the structural stuff, I think. All right, so exterior details, we'll just kind of keep rocking on real quick. Um, basically, driveways, balcony decks, garage slabs, and sidewalks. We talked about, uh, tell me your name again, David, David. We talked about slab jacking. I actually wrote that down because that's something that we're asked for a lot. Slab jacking is a trademark term for poke a hole in concrete, shoot micro silica fume grout in it to lift it or foam. Um, both things are fine. Uh, we've done it. We'll do it. It's a great way to fill voids and hollow slabs too. We've done that a lot. Um, but it's not always worth it. When you're trying to level out sidewalks or garage slabs, we're going to look at it like we're in a helicopter. There are racers right yeah. there. Yeah. That race is bad, boy. 
So pretend like we're in a helicopter. Are you guys familiar with uh, the word plan, the, the plan view and elevation? Plan view is if you're looking at something, a set of plans, or anything from up top down that's plan view, like as if you were in a helicopter on a drawing. Elevation is if I'm looking at it directly, like I'm looking at Tim or that TV. That's an elevation. Um, and then there's cross section, which is how I've drawn here. That's looking down the barrel of the shotgun. So if we're looking at plan view at a slab in a garage or a driveway, and we've got random cracking, we even have one like that. That's typically because they didn't do control cuts in their concrete with a saw to encourage the cracking at that location. And we see this a lot because they used to not do that. When we have cracking like this, I really have a hard time selling to the customer that I can come in, inject this. And other people have a fine time with it. I just don't. And I'm okay with it. But when we inject, we often displace this ends up getting higher than this. There's a way to meter it, but it still looks like a crack unless you overlay it. Most of the time we run into the cost consideration of, I don't just do this new. So I present to the client, now here's the deal, I can slab jack that or I can shoot grout under it and lift it, but it's still gonna look like a crack. Can't guarantee you that it's gonna be dead nuts. Sure not sure, it's certainly not sure you're gonna enjoy it, like it, the look of it, the aesthetic of it. It just really rubs up against the cost of removal and, and re-pouring a lot of times. So I really take, take that into consideration when we're looking at these because the rub is about, I mean, most of the time it's only 10 to 20% more expensive to remove and re-pour. Um, I always offer that to the client. So when you see those out there, you know that I'm probably gonna say, let's just, let's just get a number to remove that. And, put you back something new. I think that's really the best way to do it. Um, so leveling of homes and concrete though, and, and footings and stem walls, that's a different deal. We were gonna, I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later, and that's when we, uh, we do uh, structural pin pile placement for structural stabilization. That's when we basically drive pin piles into the earth, coming up to refusal, coming in contact with bedrock, and then we bolt it or we pour a pile cap on top of it underneath the existing footing to basically arrest future movement completely, transferring the load of the house that the concrete is supposed to be holding down into bedrock. So we do that often. And that's a really great way to stop settling. And we can also at times then do that same method and then jack it back up to level it most of the collateral damage from doing that on these older homes typically outweighs the client's desire for that to happen. They would rather just be cool with it. We'll fix the finishes, like level the floor. So anyway, um, I don't always like doing this. So we do uh, garage, so that's your garage kind of driveway situation when we have cracking. Um, balcony decks. We do waterproof membranes on balcony decks and all, all the time. Um, we're, all, the, all the big buildings that you see being built around here, we're constantly doing um, this for, Dawson Construction is our largest client, and we do almost all of their waterproofing work but below grade. Same kind of stuff as Jensen Lee Construction? Jensen Lee does vinyl. Vinyl, okay. And that has got about a seven year lifespan. And uh, the materials, J Jensen actually uh, refers us often to people. Cool. Yeah, and we're often uh, before him, before he installs his railings. Yeah. So uh, we've actually subbed under him a, a number of times. Yeah, good dude. Yeah. So uh, the vinyl sometimes is what people can afford, and that's great. But we typically can offer, depending upon the size, a five to 10 year warranty with these systems, but uh, they've been in place on bridges. For, we're basically doing a bridge technique on residential balcony decks that has been placed for, since 1984. So really great system. These are the things that we can always offer. So your garage slabs, your driveway cracking, and then your balcony decks, we have all kinds of ways to fix those. 
What we typically see on balcony decks is rot, the same way that we see below grade in crawl spaces. The joist systems and the beams that are holding them up are done. We typically get a contractor in there before us to repair that, resheet, and then apply our waterproof membrane. That's a big deal around here. People didn't build it right. We've got a lot of interesting things from a wall to deck joint. Uh, those open up, uh, they get exposed to the weather, and everybody just decked around here is facing to the water, which is where the storms go down. So we're constantly repairing rock in, those, in that. Can I ask you an opinion? Absolutely. Um, you're talking about the different builders around here, they didn't do it right. Why isn't that being done right at the beginning? Is there codes for that? Or is no, you know, that's, it, 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 there, there's really not necessarily. There's assemblies that are in drawings that people definitely, like of an architect on new homes now, they'll have that done. But we're talking about mostly in the 90s and even further back where it just kind of, or the homeowner did it and they screwed in a ledger board to their siding and then they, Put down some plywood and they went to hardware sales and got Geico and they spread Geico all over it and, and it fails in a couple of years. They don't do anything about it, it gets worse. That's kind of the, the big deal that we're, we're looking at. Um, nowadays, you're seeing way better detail on waterproofing and an air barrier around the exterior. So we're seeing way, way better, way better accountability. The city, County, code, they really don't speak to waterproofing that much because they really want life safety taken care of. Um, all right, so here's a, kind of the, here's some of the cool stuff. Um, we talked about, well, that's all the cool stuff. We talk about services to fix. So what I love doing um, is obviously pleasing a client. They're like, whoa, this is really more than I anticipated. Um, I like being transparent with the way that we want to do things. I'm okay with being different. I'm okay with kind of saying, this is what I know is tried and true. And I would introduce new products to this marketplace all the time. Um, but when it comes to repairing concrete slabs, I really like doing crack repair, waterproofing, and then we offer a coating. So a lot of guys are really, guys in particular, are really interested in their garage with an epoxy coating on it. So we do food and beverage, big industrial plants with our epoxy coatings and urethane slurries. Most every brewery in town that you've been in, we've done. But the garage slab coating with the flake or anti-slip in it is a really, really cool way to improve the aesthetic of your house uh, and repair or make everything look seamless and monolithic after we've done crack repair. It's it's a really great way to go. So I always just want to throw that out there. It's kind of one of those bolt up things as an option. And you're start, we're starting to do more and more of it as people are really interested in kind of keeping their surfaces protected and it's slippery around here. And we've had a, we recently did a job up on Chuckanut for an older um, lady who had fallen, and we wanted the anti. We needed the anti-slipper stuff. I mean, that's just what it is. We do have, offer a, an entire array of anti-slip coating materials. It's really, really enjoy doing that. Our guys really like it. It's one of the, kind of the only kind of aesthetic, publicly viewed things we do because we are technicians of the underworld, so we don't, people don't get to, yeah, go over that crawl space on Williams and, yeah, check out all those cool posts. People could care less about that stuff. Right. <laughs> they want to see the pretty stuff, right? So, uh, let's see. I think we're nearly there. I just wanted to talk a few minutes about um, the permitting. Uh, it is important, and I, I really, I work closely with a ton of real estate agents in this marketplace. And uh, we are very transparent, we want to tell everybody everything. So when we did a job that needed permitting, unexpected cost, I took it on. Uh, but I wanted to inform what had gone on because there's going to be a paper trail for it. Um, it was a very expensive, for the size of house it was, it was about a seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 crawl space rehab. And it was every 
everything, everything. And quite frankly, there could have been more. But we got it up to snuff and it was really great. The city came out and explained to me some of the reasons why we need to do it. I really appreciate it. Um, when we do this work for you or your, your clients, and the city comes along and they ask us to tweak some things, sometimes that actually delays your closing. Sometimes, yes. And we want to be really upfront with that right at the get-go. So most of these jobs for us take three or four days. When we get an inspection, we never know what we're going to get. They like seeing things like vertical joints and skirting, uh, any joint and skirting around the exterior less than a quarter of an inch. If it's a quarter of an inch or more, you have to caulk it or fill it. They don't want any airspace underneath the new skirting. They can be backfilled with earth or it can be with drain rock. I mean, there's all kinds of little things that we're learning. Water heaters and crawl space, they happen a lot. If it's natural gas and we discover it, it's not in our scope of work, and we discover it, we have to inform your client or you, if it's in the middle of a transaction, that they have a natural gas powered water heater in their crawl space and they need to get a certified someone to come and vent that out properly and secure it. We can't. What about a furnace? Um, likely same thing if it's natural gas. I would just air to that side of caution for sure. So we're learning a lot after 10 years of being in this thing. We've got a lot of, a lot of nuances. Um, I shared with you the email from the city. So I think we're pretty much kind of on the way here to completion. Uh, but I just wanted to open up. Does anybody have any questions and at all about weird things they've seen or stuff we do that I haven't explained good enough or any idea? Do you guys have idea? a service fee for going out to give a bid? Yeah, we do. And it's right there on the top. Oh, that's true. So okay. we started we started doing that pretty early on. Um, I could basically employ uh, a human being full time to <laughs> do that. Oh, yeah. I believe it. And we can't. Um, and so we charge two hundred bucks in Wacom, two hundred and fifty outside. Well, Skagit. And after that, if you have a job, if you have a cell or something in Oak Harbor or something random you want us to go look at, I basically track the miles and hours and charge accordingly and give you a rough idea. Um, so 200 bucks, 250 in Skagit. Uh, we have, I've given you guys examples of our estimate. I think they make a lot of sense to the client. I've, uh, we are constantly complimented. I'm gonna grab one of these things real quick. Um, this is another thing that we do that I would really love to point out to you. Jason Small, uh, he's actually running around the field today, so he's unable to. We actually produce um, a complete diagram so that you guys understand, so your client understands, the homeowner understands that uh, what we are doing and where we are doing it. We do that for our crawl space rehab too. This isn't a structural engineering deal. This is nothing more than say, hey, this is what we're up to. This is what we're going to do. There's a location that's going to be in. We cool? That's what it's all about. Just trying to be as much, give as much information to the customer base as possible. Um, I really like the way that Jason has developed this part of our business. It's going really well. And I think when you guys meet him, um, you're really going to see why. He was in the field with me for a long time. He's an ex-principal of high school. And he came to work for us. And it's a perfect fit. So, yeah. Uh, two questions. Um, one is a lot of times we'll have the inspector do the inspection and he says uh, inspector uh, did a visual inspection of the crawl space and identified the fact that there is water standing water in the crawl space could you speak to water in the crawl space sure second question is vents venting, mm. venting in the crawl space and the people that plug their vents in the winter time is best practices for both. Best practices when you find water in a crawl space, best practices okay. with vents. Yeah, so uh, water in crawl space. I mentioned the fact that that's just the, us putting the house on the top of the earth, right? In the Northwest. <coughs> you know, I mean, it's going to happen. So what we do there is we definitely do the vapor barrier. There has been times that we have had to call in like Bayside services 
or uh, Barry Acres International that has these big vac trucks. And we have actually had to vacuum out all of the water and all the sludge underneath homes. We have to be fairly careful with that, depending upon soil conditions, because we as the contractor don't want to go in and undermine the house. So we have to be very careful with that. That's one way we have to do it when it is extreme. The other thing that we do, we used to do, let me phrase that, we used to do internal crawl space drainage. I had a mutiny. Uh, just what, it's too many sick employees. Um, it's not okay. I have gotten to a place and had to make a decision, a business decision to not offer that service anymore. Uh, so the best way that we mitigate that is we can put a sump pump on the outside and we can do, it's kind of outboard of the house and we can do some perforation, perf pipe around the exterior in a crawl, in a crawl space that doesn't necessarily not the same as a basement. And so then we can actually suck some of that water out. That's one way to do it. But when we're on the outside of the house, we either have to daylight or we have to go, go get a permit. We have to go get a permit to get it tied into the, the sewer main or storm. So the work that the mutiny, the that caused the mutiny, would it be a guy goes in there and basically digs some French drains to a sump pump location? Is that basically in what? In a crawl space. In a crawl yeah, space. Yeah. And that, that is a solution. With a shovel this big. Right, on their belly. Right, so basically you need that water moving to the lowest part of the crawl yes. space. Because if you have water coming in, I guess there's two things that I think of. One is, what's the source of the water? Where's it coming from? How's yeah. it getting in there? And then how do, we, how do we either stop it from getting in there or how do we, if you can't stop it from getting in there, how do we get it to a okay. place that we can get it moving out? Mitigation. In and out. So here's what you do. First of all, we go into a ton of homes in the town spouts are just dumping right, right on them. That is a big yeah. no-no. So there's a prescribed plan, it's a drawing, it's been designed by the city of Bellingham for our storm water. It's called an infiltration ditch, some people call it a dispersion ditch. And it is simple. It is, we come in and we excavate a 15, I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, I would have forgot it. Um, dispersion or infiltration ditch is 15 feet long, minimum two feet deep, two feet wide, we take the downspouts, we run them into the dispersion ditches. We have to honor all setbacks, all easements, et cetera, property lines. We gotta honor all that stuff. And so we gotta sometimes get creative with the way that we direct the water. We'll do a tortured path and then finally find the place for the, 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 the ditch. And so we dig it out, we install free draining rock, drain material, and then we put a perp pipe in, in it sleeve just like I showed you here the same kind of detail and then we backfill it and we typically put sod or grass seed depending upon what the customer wants so that's one way to so get we're that tight out. lining those downspouts to a rain garden essentially to a rain garden tight line all the way to the dispersion ditch once tight line we, mean that's there's no tight lines no perforation, perforation. Okay. so let's pretend so right now, let's say we've got a downspout, it goes down and yep. it, just, it just dumps all the water right next yep. to the foundation. Yep. And it's an old house, mm -hmm. they, have, they don't even have splash blocks, they got nothing. Yep. So you could tight line that. The city of Bellingham is the best practices pro procedures yep. that they approve to yep. go ahead and do that. Yeah. We have it. Cool. We have it. And in fact, unless we disturb more than, I think it may have changed to 250 square feet of soil, I can't remember. No, it was five at one time. We don't even, I mean, we don't really need a permit. So it infiltrates on site through the rain right. garden. Yes, and it goes in and then it goes tight line till we reach the infiltration or dispersion ditch. And then it goes to the perforated pipe that then disperses into the gravel and then into your, into your yard. But at least we're away from the house. And we're getting away yeah. from the house. That's a very effective method okay. that has been signed, sealed, delivered, and blessed from on high. And we're good. So that's a great way to do it. The other thing that we do often is that, that sump pump detail on the outside, if we can't get to that wet well or that dry well or that dispersion or infiltration ditch, we can pump it over to it. Uh -huh. It starts getting a little bit more costly, but we can do that too. Um, those are great ways to do it. The 10 to 15 mil vapor barrier keeps that water underneath the vapor barrier. That's a great way to do it. Um, short of lifting the house up and pouring concrete and waterproofing it, right? Yeah. That's, a, that's a really great way to do, go about that. And then the other thing was ventilation in a crawl space. All right, 
there are building profession, building scientists out there that I know, building all the guys that I know, and I kind of my expertise kind of stops inside inside the house. I'm not as I don't know enough. I don't have enough bandwidth to keep all that together anyway. So we do air barriers on new construction all the way down through waterproofing. So the way that we kind of um, what we look for are two things. You either want to you want to mechanically ventilate your crawl space by treating it like it is a conditioned space. So that entails fiberglass bat insulation in your crawl space in the in the in the four cavity. Insulate it up. Vapor barrier sometimes there too. Vapor barrier on, on the ground, terminated the way that I talked about, booting up every pus, terminating up the walls. Good old fashioned Panasonic fan that you have in your bathroom. A whole house fan in your basement. Yep, 52% humidity, huh. kicks on. Some people, uh, they, let's see, Lee Laney, he always likes, he likes continual operation. Um, but there are ways to minimize that. Um, those are guys that I would love to introduce you to. Lee Laney would be a, a wonderful teacher for that sometime too. I can connect you with him. Um, he's now with Geotest, starting their new, it's cool. So, but that's who I've learned a lot from. The other rule of thumb, so these building scientists argue back and forth, and I can honestly say that I don't know that there's a better way. Sometimes there is because it's constructability. What is, the, what is the application that we're looking at? What's it needing? Um, sometimes it's tighten the thing up, insulate, do the mechanical ventilation, you're golden. Second thing is put the vapor barrier down, make sure you have enough vents all the way around your house, and make sure that your floor is insulated. And then leave it open. And people close up in the winter. If you have insulation, you'll need to. So uh, I really like the mechanically ventilated so in the mechanically ventilated, you have probably less vents. You would have no vents. No 